Hi, my name is Anthony Custer, and I'm a lecturer here at the Faculty of Public Health at Konkan University in Northeastern Thailand. And we're going to start a short course on systematic and systematized literature reviews. We're going to be focused on those reviews within the occupational health and safety field, since this is part of the seminar on occupational health and safety course. Uh, but the information that we learn here is relevant to uh, most fields within the health and medical sciences. This is going to be part one of a video, and we're going to talk about the introduction to systematic review. So we're going to define what a systematic review is and differentiate between some of the other types of reviews that are similar. Uh, we're going to talk about the elements that a systematic review has, and we'll also look at some examples, which we'll use throughout the remainder of this course on systematic reviews. So let's start with the definition. The definition of a systematic literature review is a formal, structured research study that seeks to find, assess, and analyze studies on a specific question. So the key here is that there's a formal and structured process to find, to acquire, so as we're searching for the studies to include within the systematic review, there's going to be a formal process to it. We're going to define uh, search terms, we're going to define the databases, and it's something that could be uh, replicated by someone else because they could follow the same steps that we follow. That's what makes it systematic. Um, the other key thing here is that it says find, assess, and analyze. So not only do we search for and then uh, screen out studies that don't fit, but then we assess the quality of them and we also then finally analyze or synthesize the data into a complete report. And a systematic literature review needs to have a specific question. So that will mean that we have to define uh, what is our specific population, for example. Are we looking at a particular intervention? Um, what outcomes are we looking for, for the studies to measure, for them to be included into our systematic review? And as it says here, systematic reviews follow a defined search plan where the criteria is clearly stated before the review is conducted. It's comprehensive, transparent search that can be replicated and reproduced by other researchers. So let's look at what, the ele what elements a systematic review should have. Well, first, a systematic review should be done with at least three team members. And those team members should have varied expertise. Now, one of the reasons we should have at least three team members is because as you're um, deciding to include a study into the systematic review, as you're deciding how to extract the data and assess the quality of it, um, the best practice is to have two members uh, doing that independently and then comparing your results. So if, for example, our researcher A decides that uh, this study is, is uh, eligible for including inside your systematic review and uh, researcher B thinks that it's not eligible, uh, then there's a disagreement. And, and normally use a third team member uh, to break the tie. Um, if both researcher A and researcher B agree, well then it's included or, or not included based on what they agree on. Uh, the second element of a systematic review is that there's a clearly defined research question using the PICOS framework, and we'll define what that is later, uh, but that stands for population, intervention, um, uh, outcome, and, and study design. And there should be explicit inclusion and exclusion criteria for uh, including within the systematic review. So you're going to be looking at lots of different studies. You're going to try to come up with a list of possible studies, and there should be an explicit uh, criteria stated for whether or not a study should be included. So for example, uh, commonly if you're doing uh, some of the medical uh, intervention type uh, systematic reviews, uh, a 
specific inclusion criteria is that the study design is a randomized controlled trial. And that's usually not the case for uh, our, what we're doing here in occupational health and safety. A lot of the study designs tend to be um, observational if we're looking for environmental health uh, exposure, for example. On the other hand, we, we might be looking for something that involves an intervention uh, to improve uh, health and safety outcomes. And if that's the case, we might consider that a randomized controlled trial is a necessary uh, criteria for inclusion because this is the best study design uh, for uh, determining whether or not an intervention is effective or not. Um, the third element of a systematic review is that it has a written protocol. Now, so that what that means is that, for example, search criteria and the database and everything that you're going to do as part of the systematic review is written out and we do that beforehand um, and a truly uh, high quality systematic review will even publish that protocol beforehand. The fourth element of a systematic review uh, is that it should be replicable, the search strategy should be replicable, and it should use many databases. It should also uh, be searching gray literature, which is, means like PhD, uh, dissertations, uh, government documents, and uh, any other type of document that might be out there on the internet, not just those that are published within the uh, research databases. The fifth element of a systematic review is that it should follow reporting guidelines, and there's many, many different, I list a few here, they often have these uh, acronyms like PRISMA, Equator, Moose, Strobe. Um, we'll be talking about a few of those in more detail in this course. Um, but a systematic review needs to have uh, set guidelines that makes it fit within a framework that's considered the best practice for doing it. And finally, a systematic review is going to normally take a long time. It's going to take about a year. It could take longer. 10 to 18 months is what's shown here. And uh, these are not my ideas. These, these elements uh, come from Brown University School of Public Health. Um, and some of the ideas are also uh, in this article here, published in 2009. It was a typology of different types of reviews, not just systematic reviews. Now, if your review does not meet all of those criteria that I just listed, then it probably does not qualify as a systematic review. And that's okay. There are, there are other types of review. And I want to highlight one particular kind, which is called a systematized review. A systematized review is similar to a systematic review. It includes one or more of the elements that we talked about. But maybe one of several of those elements are missing. So for example, perhaps your team is less than three members. It's still possible for you to do a very comprehensive review, but perhaps it would not qualify truly as a systematic review. Um, in a systematized review also, the search strategy is comprehensive, but not exhaustive. What that means is that it's a very, very detailed search strategy. It's looking at two to three databases, at least, and it's going to have a well-defined and wide, broad uh, use of search terms. But we cannot guarantee that it's exhaustive. In other words, we can't guarantee that we have truly uh, found every possible source. A and part of this is we're doing it in a reduced time frame. And so a systematized review, uh, because of some of the kind of shortcuts that we can take, uh, may not take as long, and maybe we can complete it in maybe three to six months, something like that. So, 
let's be clear about some of the different kinds of reviews. I've given you a, a detailed description of a systematic literature review, and I've described to you how uh, a similar type of review that's not quite as comprehensive and exhaustive, we can call a systematized review. And these two reviews that we're talking about fall somewhere in the middle of this spectrum that I'm showing you here. On the left-hand side, we see the literature review. Now, this is any type of review um, that we often do as part of our, our research, and, and uh, it means to go and to review the literature and, and to read and to look through different sources, pull out the relevant information and summarize it and synthesize it into a narrative. This we call any type of literature review. There's not necessarily a systematic process to it. It's that just as we search and we find uh, different things and maybe we read one article and it references to another article and, uh, and we kind of go through that path. This is what we call a literature review. When we start to build in a, a set process that has a defined search terms, a defined inclusion exclusion criteria, uh, when it defines how we're going to extract the data, it now becomes a systematized review. And when we meet all of the criteria that I listed, it becomes a systematic literature review. And then finally, the last thing is, which we're not going to talk about in this course, but if we add one more element, which is to pool together, that is to, to bring together all of the data, the quantitative data that we extract from the outcomes of all of our studies, and put them together as if it was one big database and analyze that data, we would call that a meta-analysis. And you will often see that these two terms go together. There might be a publication that says this is a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, but for this course, we're going to really focus on defining what a systematic literature review is and what a systematized review is, and I'm going to lead you through the steps that you need to do to complete that, and the steps that I'll lead you through will be enough to get you a systematized review, to meet the definition of what we call a systematized review. And that's what we'll be doing throughout this course. So let's talk about the steps that are generally involved. The first thing we have to do is we need to define our research question. So we need to define the scope and this is where we can define the inclusion-exclusion criteria. So for example, you might be looking at studies that uh, report some level of exposure of a chemical within a specific population, let's say it's adults, 18 and older, uh, within a specific environment. Perhaps they're working in a retail space and they're exposed to a cleaning chemical and so you can say that all studies that report uh, exposure, and, that, and you might define how it's measured, uh, exposure to a specific chemical in a specific environment to a specific population that's measured in a specific way, perhaps breathing space or inside the body as a biomarker. And so now we know when we look at a study, we can clearly understand does this study report that information? Does it measure that specific outcome in the way that we talked about? Because if it doesn't, then it doesn't meet the inclusion criteria, and we're not going to include it in our systematic review. That's the first step, defining our research question. Second, <clears throat> we need to search. So we're going to uh, specify the databases, and I'll give you um, three to four databases that you'll search. And you'll set up a set of search terms, and we'll talk about that. It's not just typing a couple words in. We'll end up putting together a long string of search terms using what's called Boolean terms, like and and or, using things like wildcards and synonyms uh, to make sure that our search captures every possible uh, study that might be worth including into our systematic review. The goal is to make the net broad and wide enough that we capture everything. And then we have to just uh, screen out the ones that don't fit. And that 
leads us to the, the third step, which is screening and inclusion. So after we've searched and we get back all of our search results, we'll put that into a database, uh, a citation management software. And as we go through that, we read the abstracts. And we, we decide whether or not based on the title and on the abstract. Um, usually it's pretty clear uh, that the study is uh, about something else and uh, we, we don't need to include it. We don't need to include it for screening. After screening, we might have a small number of studies that we want to read the full text. So we have to go and we find the full text. We then read the paper and, and then understand, does it meet the inclusion or exclusion criteria? And we finally get ourselves down to the last, smallest set of studies that uh, after we've screened them, We've, by reading the abstract and the title, and then we've read the full text, and we say, yes, these are the studies that meet our inclusion and exclusion criteria. They have the outcome that we're looking for. And finally, we extract that data, put it all together into a table, <clears throat> and we synthesize the results. We, we, we see what does this show us? Are there any gaps in knowledge that we need to study further? Um, what are the trends? in the data that we see when we write a report about that. So here's a few examples, and this is what we're looking at throughout the course. Um, a few of them uh, are best to be considered um, a systematic review, and a few of them uh, would be considered not quite a systematic review, but a systematized review. <clears throat> so for example, there's improving the mental health among people living with HIV. And this is, it's a review. So this one is a systematized review. Similarly, we have evidence-based information needs of public health workers, a systematized review. For example, you see there's one author. So we know that it wouldn't really meet the criteria of a systematic review if it's only one person working on the team. Over on the right-hand side, we have three reviews which um, Call themselves systematic reviews. We have ergonomics in violin and piano playing, ergonomics and musculoskeletal disorders in neurosurgery, and we have indoor air quality of environments used for physical exercise and sports practice. And I'll make sure that the PDFs of these are available in the Google Classroom. A lot of these are uh, open access, for the, so for those of you uh, uh, watching this on YouTube, you can also um, uh, access most of these as open access, but you may not uh, be able to access them if your uh, university or institution doesn't subscribe. We can see clearly from the titles what the scope of the and the research question is. So for example, if it says ergonomics and musculoskeletal disorders in neurosurgery, we know we're talking about the population of neurosurgeons, people that work in a specific occupation, surgeons that are doing neurosurgery. We want to look at what is the prevalence and the causes, for example, of ergonomics and musculoskeletal disorders. And so it's going to have a very narrow focus uh, to that. Okay, so that's our overview, that's our introduction. Um, there'll be more videos coming up later that will give more details about um, each of the steps involved and guide you through that. So uh, until next time, we'll see you.